So I'm going to welcome Stephen Heminger. Uh, he's going to give us a talk uh, and say, demystify what could possibly be in a name. Thank you. While they play with the slides, um, nothing seems to piss users off more than naming. I've, got, I've gotten discussions with customers, and I've had more issues over naming than crashes, bugs, performance, anything else. Changing names breaks user scripts, and causes fights, and really gets into a deep rat hole. So this talk is not about solving the problem. It's about framing the problem. It's about giving you the information about what's going on, where it's coming from, and some of the pitfalls that I've seen. Let's start off with ETH0. Does anybody here know how old ETH0 is? Well, I did a little backtracking, and it's before pretty much everybody in this room was using Linux. It's almost 25 years old. 24 years ago, in Net1 version of Linux, there was a hard-coded file in the time it was in Net TCP space that said, there's a 3COM card. It's at this address. And if we see it, we'll give it each zero. There's another one. And if it's at this address, we'll give it ETH0. So that name was actually hard-coded all the way back from the first implementations of networking in Linux. And this slide got a little messed up. The place that this shows up externally to a lot of networking customers is in SNMP. And let me just fill these in because so in SNMP, there's a number of values for a network interface. And in SNMP, all these map to things that exist in our Linux networking stack today. The first one is the IF index, which in SNMP, every object has an ID, and the index is the last part of the ID for network interfaces. So we just map that to the IF index in Linux. The type is whether it's Ethernet, FDDI, InfiniBand, anything like that. You have a MAC address field, and there's a name. And if you read the standard, it is the name that is suitable for display on the console. So basically, they kind of assume you have a CLI that you interact with a networking stack, and that's the name you handle you use for the naming. There's also something called IF description. And if you read the fine print, they expect you to fill in the manufacturer version, et cetera, of that. In recent versions of Linux SNMP, I hooked in to have the PCI library go dumpster dive and figure out, oh, that's an Intel IXGBE version 3, whatever, based on that information. And the last one is IF alias, which is user-provided information. So your typical networking switch customer will fill in on his CLI that that's the one connected to the backbone network. That's the other ones connected to the internal network so that when they use their SNMP to query their switch, they can say that this one is connected to that network. And all these fields exist today in Linux networking stack. So in Linux, I'll get to the later ones now. We're familiar with these zero. Well, so what do other operating systems do? The granddaddy of Unix networking, BSD, <coughs> uses a name that is based on the device driver. So the original Unix networking BSD had 3COM cards, and they were named EN012 or whatever. And uh, if you use the Intel IXGBE driver on 
FreeBSD today, you get IXGBE0123. Can anybody see what's wrong with that? If I take out the Intel card and I put in a Mellanox card in my server, all of a sudden the names change. That's not a very friendly thing to do. Um, Windows does it based on a usage model, which is pretty, which is sort of nice, but ends up with this really long name and none of, since Windows is 90% GUI based, nobody ever sees the name anyway. They just see a little icon. So you'll get Ethernet adapter one, Ethernet adapter two, or Hyper-V virtual Ethernet adapter as the full long name. Um, so they're kind of using the IF alias kind of model for naming. If you look at Juniper and Cisco, they both use different things. Juniper kind of being a BSD thing, what they do is they take this part, which is really what kind of hardware you have in it, um, and then they have a basically chassis slot um, port naming with slashes. And Cisco does, well, everything before used to be like you had Ethernet, fast Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet. So they get longer and longer, and they use a naming like this. In fact, when I was at when we were at Viata, there was people that wanted us to switch over to putting slashes in the name. Uh, that was like not a good idea. The, the reason I bring these up is just because you will have customers that are coming from other environments that have a different expectation. And that's an important part. So some of the issues are, the first thing that shows up with the original Linux naming scheme was, originally Linux 2.4, probed in parallel. Actually, originally it was a table, like a set of three com, whatever. So it was totally linear, totally serial, totally predictable. We switched off to modern PCI architectures and initially they were probing sequentially. And modern architectures, we probe PCI in parallel. So in fact, which one's going to come first is not deterministic. And so if you had two cards, you'd get each zero at each one. And sometimes they'd be swapped on some machines and not others. The other one that's a problem is for some of these buried in our POSIX world standards is IF name size. IF name size being 16 characters means you have 15 characters for your interface name. No more. Um, I'll show you an example where that hits, but I've seen that hit several other times in customer situations. And changing that is pretty much a, no, a non-starter today. Um, there's too many places that would get impacted. Also related to that, um, there are, well, I can go on and on about. The other one, I mentioned consistency is a real problem. People want to have different machines in different places all come up with the same sequence of interfaces. Um, there was a customer that we had that the way they worked is they provide a virtual hosting model where you would provision and instead of getting a VM, you would get basically a white box and a rack. And they would pull different white boxes out of the rack and they would put your image on it. Problem with that is different hardware would come up in different orders, different sequences. How would you manage that? That if that was a Dell today and next one was an HP server and they came up with different interface names. You were, uh, the, the last one is there are situations, and I'll go into some later, where you get totally illogical numbering. Um, you get values that are off the charts, names that are way too long, and make no sense at all, and those drive the customer completely nuts. <laughs> and all these things can make. So what were the early pioneers in network naming? Well, the first one that showed up was UDEV, which is the way we have scripts that handle hot plug events. And you could have, there's a layer of scripts, and the layer of scripts would see a hot plug event of a network device and try to apply some rules to get some naming. The initial version of that was based on the MAC address of the device. That was 
to maintain persistence. So every time it came up with the same MAC address, it would get the same name. That works fine on a single machine. It doesn't work when you take that image and you take that image and put it on another machine and there's a different MAC address. So it's very common for a customer to bring up one, in, one VM, put it on another one, and all of a sudden ETH0, there was no ETH0, there was ETH1 because it was a different address. And modern versions of the UDAV rules do the same thing, but they do it based on PCI information so that at least it's, if it's in the same slot, comes up with the same name. Um, so the next attempt was done by Matt Domish at Dell, where he wrote something called BIOS dev name, which basically said, oh, I saw an interface name. Let's go dumpster diving in the system and see if I can come up with a good name for that. The problem with that program was it was he was solving a problem in a very small domain, which was basically Dell servers. And it also pretty much had kind of the most deep level access to the system. It was going in and de decoding DMI tables through dev mem to get raw access to device memory. So it was, it was basically going as deep as it possibly could in a very system specific manner and often it would not work. So it never really got widely deployed, although it had the right intentions. So the next thing came along, which is the system D developers saw the persistent network name problem and started to attack it. And uh, I love the sock puck of attacking the world. <laughs> but they, they basically, Started, started with the same underlying model of BIOS dev name, but did it in a more consistent manner using standard interfaces. And at the same time, the kernel and the PCI environment had gotten smarter, so more information was available to user space to do naming. So what kinds of names do you see today with a systemd UDEV based thing? The first one is if you have onboard network devices. These are ones on like management consoles and so on that don't show up on the bus. If they were reported by ACPI, it will name them with EN01. Um, if the PCI Express bus has slot information, it will use that to make a name like ENS3. If it doesn't have slot information, it will use the PCI address to make a name. If you plug a USB stick in, it uses the MAC address to make a name. And if it doesn't do anything, it goes back to the, whatever was there before. So what could possibly go wrong? Everything's solved. Well, we have problems with every one of these. First of all, oops. First of all, the onboard BIOS one. We had a box that we were supporting that had four e uh, ethernets in the back. And they were labeled one, two, three, four. Well, of course, the ACPI BIOS information did not report the, the onboard port number to match the labels on the back of the box. Needless to say, you don't want to tell the customer that port, the one that's labeled two is really one, and the one that's labeled three is really four. Um, and it took several weeks of meetings to convince the vendor to get the, a, the BIOS fixed to make the slot numbering match the tags on the back. The next one, oops, the PCI slot information. Well, likewise, why is the first one that shows up on most boxes slot three? It's really because the ACPI decides to number one and two for like an internal bus root port and something else. There's nothing, there's no logical reason that it's always slot three. Um, also, once again, you're relying on non-broken firmware to give you good data. Uh, PCI location, um, that basically means you're expecting that PCI location information 
is consistent across machines, and it's not. It can often be the case if you have the system vendor situation, you have a Dell and HP, they'll have different PCI buses, completely different naming. And the MAC address one, can anybody think what's wrong with that one? That's a 15 character name. The standard convention to put a VLAN on the end of something is go dot VLAN. Can't do it. Um, not, not only that, if you had to type it, you're going to go. And going back to none of the above basically means you're throwing your hands up um, and, and a lot of virtualization environments and other things, all of the above don't work, and you end up with E0 again. Um, so it's making a good effort, but it's not really solving the problem. The other one that shows up is in the cloud. The way people typically do it is they set up one image and they want to make thousands of copies of the same image. And they want the names of the devices to come up exactly the same. And not only that, not all of those images will be deployed on the same model of uh, server. So you might have situations where you have uh, some four CPU um, deployments, you might have 64 CPU deployments, you might have four, in, four connections on one and two on another, and it's not consistent. And the naming has to be consistent for the applications to show up. The other one that shows up is in virtualization environments, we don't really have a PCI bus. What happens is on Hyper-V, we have a VM bus. Zen has a Zen bus. KVM emulates PCI. And all of those buses tend to give, try to give information that will give you a network name, but the values they give may be completely off. For example, a recent thing that showed up was on VMware, they would give a different very large PCI number range in order to separate the pass-through devices where they're passing through the real physical hardware to the virtualized PCI. And the virtualized PCI would be way out in a very big number. And so you'd end up with EN slot 1395.33. And so in fact, recent versions of system D say basically, if the slot number is bigger than this large value, something's whacked and ignore it. Um, so all of these emulated buses do crazy things and pretty much can almost guarantee to break the naming. The other one that shows up is on Hyper-V, the way we handle SIRLV is that you have a, the network interface card and you'll pass through a virtual function device into the guest and we'll also pass a synthetic device into the guest, and the two are paired one-to-one. -one. And then we bond them above that. They both have the same MAC address, and if you go and you click, if you were using like Windows Server, and you click and you turn off SIRLV on the GUI, this device gets hot plugged away. Or if I migrate you, you get migrated to another one. Um, this creates all sorts of um, interesting naming issues because the customer really wants to have E0 talking to its management stack. Um, la so one of the, here are some of the ideas that I wanted to go over and I don't think that they're solutions, they're just teasers at this point. Um, AWS and what we're doing on Azure is tried to have customers standardized using ETH0 for their management interface. Um, whether that can be a de facto standard or whether it's just a codification of what everybody uses, that's fine. In order to deal with the um, migration issue, uh, I think we need to have some tools and user space that are ready to deal with that whether that's fixing Network Manager or fixing Team D to deal with, I'm dealing with a migrated interface that needs to have active and passive ports 
In order, the other one that I seeded some RFCs to the mailing list and we have some discussions about is if you get back to this situation, you really want to hide these guys from existing or being visible unless you ask for it in the guest operating system so that applications and other things don't go, what are these confusing things I see? Uh, network interfaces that I, should I be playing with them and should I be configuring them? Um, there has been a couple suggestions on a way to hide them. The other option is use network namespaces, but that runs into problems because the tools that you're trying to build to manage this can't see the devices they need to manage. Um, so we need to figure out how to solve that problem. Lastly, um, I recently ran into, we don't support it yet, in Hyper-V there's a way to, with Windows, you can actually configure that the VM switch port has additional information saying, I am connected to your management network that you can go configure and then be able to pass that information up into the guest. And I think that that would be very useful in general so that you could have metadata information about what network an interface is connected to populate up into the guest. And that would be great for orchestration because then you could just orchestrate a thousand machines and each of which would know what it's connected to based on information from the host. And maybe even having tools and APIs, maybe as minor as, you know, standard library support for that. Um, so in conclusion, naming is a real issue. As kernel developers tend to think about moving packets, but unless people think about how to talk to them, um, real customers get really upset. And I'd like to see the vendors, the communities, not just the kernel community, but the user space communities working together to have better solutions for this. Um, and so that I don't have to sit in boring meetings where people yell at me. Thank you. <laughs> and what? Uh, okay, Jamal says I have a chance for time for a few questions. Use the mic, please. Anybody? Come on. You agree with everything you said? <laughs> Hiding slave interfaces? It's funny, you mentioned if name size, because it seems that this restriction forced us to think about the problem instead of letting people make 1K long names with all kinds oh, of I things. Oh, I agree. So I think it's kind of a nice situation we have. I just throw out there one other thing that we have seen on the virtualization environments is if you change the instances set of interfaces, then the PCI buses will re-enumerate oh, between yeah. boots, and that changes the names as well. The other thing that happens is the order of interfaces on most virtualization environments is based on where, what order you added them to the guest in whatever API you had, whether it's a GUI or command line, which is kind of convenient, but not really necessarily good if you actually added them in the wrong order. How do you go get that corrected? Uh, which I guess in the virtualization environment, you just basically say, oh, well, throw out my hands, throw away that work, and we'll start it over again. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs>